welcome to the commencement ceremony for the Yale Law School Class of 2022. We're so glad to have you here. We are incredibly appreciative for all of you for coming here to celebrate from near and far, because it feels like a gift to be able to celebrate together. So I hope that in the warmth of one another's presence and the excitement of the ceremonies complete with the Fife and Drum Corps, that you've had a chance to luxuriate in this moment. So I'm going to say a few words later on, but I want to begin by introducing our first speaker. It's my privilege to introduce you all to a member of the faculty known for what seems like the simplest and yet most important act, helping others, whether it's as students or communities in need across the globe. This year's faculty speaker is revered for his tireless work, fierce advocacy, and passion for teaching that extends far beyond the walls of this institution. I'm delighted today to introduce you to the Binger Clinical Professor of Human Rights and Director of both the Orville Schell Center of International Human Rights and the Lowenstein International Human Rights Clinic, our own Jim Sill. Okay, now I'm really, really bother Jim because I've got more to say. Um, I think Jim wanted me to stop right now, but you all voted him. We should talk about how great he is, right? So Jim has had so many jobs and has left such an indelible mark both on the world and on generations of students at YLS that in some senses we all think of him as the Dean of Human Rights Work for clinical, clinical, clinicians across the country. He's been at the helm of the Lowenstein Clinic for more than 20 years, inspiring a generation of students to serve. He coordinates the Rubina Initiative, which enabled the law school to bring numerous groundbreaking human rights scholars to study and teach here. Jim has spent decades advocating for an extraordinary range of causes and projects, empowering both up-and-coming and well-established advocates through his multidisciplinary program in human rights education. Now, some of Jim's former students have said that he teaches them to be, and I quote, ambivalent advocates. It is a phrase that perfectly captures Jim. Jim is, to be sure, zealous in representing clients, but he's always mindful of the hard questions about what, they, what lawyers do and why they do it. Jim doesn't just impart knowledge about the structures of law or the techniques of advocacy. He teaches his students to ask hard questions about the role and ethics of lawyers in our collective pursuit of justice. He helps them develop modes of perception, new ways of seeing not only the world, but also the Human Rights Project writ large. Jim teaches his students that to critique the project of human rights work is to ensure that it fulfills its promise. And even here at YLS, Jim is an ambivalent advocate. He loves this place, and he has devoted his life to it. But I suspect he worries constantly about the fact that he loves this place and devotes his life to it. He always teaches all of us how to have what Robert Frost called a lover's quarrel with YLS and the world. Under his guidance, the Lowenstein Clinic has developed a new transubstantive perspective on clinical human rights. His students are steadfast. They have written amicus briefs to the Inter-American Court of Human Rights on national obligations to combat sexual violence against children. Their research on states' duties to mitigate and remediate climate change has been used to draft the Oslo Principles on Global Climate Change Obligations. And they've applied similar human rights principles here in the United States to address the question of race and mass incarceration, shedding light on abuses such as the dependence on solitary confinement, something that has been unacknowledged for decades. Jim's approach to human rights advocacy is grounded in part by his experiences prior to law school, so you may not all know this, but by the time that Jim came to law school, he was 40 years old, and he had spent decades doing work for others. He worked for a domestic anti-poverty program, spent time in Shanghai teaching English, pursued a master's degree in American culture and humanities, and worked for the U.S. Committee for Refugees and Immigrants as an analyst and writer. Jim, in short, started as a 1L after he'd already had a career that would do anyone proud. Now, I know, um, as evident by the fact that Jim jumped up as soon as he can to stop me from talking, that at this point, Jim is completely uncomfortable about all the fuss. And that's, of course, because he's one of the most down-to-earth and decent people we have the privilege of knowing at this law school. 
He's not just a brilliant professor, but a mentor and friends. He supports his students unconditionally. He is the professor who will not just respond to your email at 3 a.m., but also come back to the law school to check on you at 11 p.m. just to make sure that the clinic brief is going okay and that you're doing okay. He gets to know his so students so well that, that he used to pick out children's books as gifts for each of them at the end of the semester, just agonizing over choosing the right one. He is a knack for bringing joy and support to the arduous work he does. It takes an incredible sense of balance and generosity to do the work that Jim so excels at. He often jokes that he was born a pessimist, but is an optimist by necessity. The clinic's work confronts some of the worst realities from humanity, but Jim teaches his students how to overcome those obstacles and doubt without falling victim to cynicism. He is our favorite pessimist, and he makes us all optimists by necessity and otherwise, and I am delighted to introduce Jim Silk to you today. Thank you, Dean, for, for that generous introduction. Uh, I think you've demonstrated one point that I was going to make. Sometimes kindness is more important than the truth. Um, th thank you, graduating students, for this wonderful honor and this opportunity to, to share a few thoughts with you on this auspicious occasion. It has touched me deeply, even if it's also completely terrified me. It's an extra honor to be sharing the platform today with the great uh, and inspiring writer Chimamanda Adichie, whose writing has beautifully illuminated my own perspective on human rights. To our graduates, congratulations in all the usual ways for all you have accomplished during your time here, for completing your studies in law. You deserve not only our congratulations, but also our admiration and thanks for the inspiring example of your strength and determination. Your time here has brought way more than one class's share of dark and disconcerting days. These last three years have been fraught with the relentlessly ugly and hateful wasteland of our national politics, an awakening not just to the future but to the present harms of climate change. Continued police killing of black men and women and boys and girls. Our refusal to face up to the pandemic of gun violence and the role of racism and hate speech in fostering it. Brutal and massive use of deadly state force in Ukraine, Yemen, Ethiopia, and countless other places that hardly make the news the growing wealth inequality between and within societies and the powerful interests that sustain it. The long, carefully orchestrated, cynical, and successful campaign to build a court that would curtail, that would attack women's rights and their very equality. And of course, a lethal pandemic and the losses and distortions and complicated constraints, including on your law school experience, that it has brought. And finally, even here in this law school that I do love, destructive interests that get in the way of our commitment to learning and caring and grappling honestly with law's challenges. So in these times of loss, of confusion, of uncertainty, where does one start a commencement address? How does one start or finish a commencement address? I want to start with a story from my graduation. I know this is hard to believe since I was 40 then, but it was 33 years ago. Um, my son, who was three and a half, walked across the platform with me. The next day, the bar review course started. And in those uh, technologically innocent days, 25 of us gathered every morning in a small conference room in the then Holiday Inn, a few blocks away, to watch videotaped lectures on topics few of us had studied. <laughs> My wife and children dropped me off for class each morning. A couple of days into the course, someone asked my son where his father was. 
Without hesitation, he answered, he used to be in law school, but now he works in a hotel. <laughs> that was usefully grounding. It gave me perspective, and it gave me a graduation speech theme, humility. Yes, there's the humility we should invoke ourselves individually to t try to keep in perspective the privilege and power that attach to us once Yale Law School is in our resumes. But what I, want, what I want to come back to in a moment is humility about the law and about the roles we play as lawyers. I considered basing my remarks entirely on lessons my children taught me, but I'm, I'm going to limit myself to one more. A year or so after graduation, uh, I was walking the playground with my children. I was trying to teach my son, then almost five, a little arithmetic. I asked, rounding down a little, if I'm 30 years older than you, how old will I be when you're five? 35, he answered. And when you're 10, what will I be? 40. So far, so good. When you're 20, what will I be? 50. So when you're 25, what will I be? Grinning up at me, he replied, dead? <laughs> Another theme, mortality. Here too, sure, I mean that our mortality should remind us to seize the day, to take advantage of every moment, moment, to live well and use our time to do good. But more than that, it is the shared human knowledge of our mortality that binds us together, that is the essence of our common destiny, the foundation of the inescapable imperative of solidarity, to which I'll return. My work is in international human rights. These guideposts of humility and solidarity have emerged from working in human rights and, more than that, from teaching the practice of human rights and, as Heather said, engaging critically with our students about it. When I found out I was speaking today, I began asking myself what the lessons I've taken from the principles and practices and problems of human rights might suggest for a broader consideration of our role as lawyers. Not so much, I thought, as I focused on the particular weakness of human rights institutions, the lack of effective local institutions and of community norms, and especially the discouraging record of atrocity in the second half of the 20th century and the first two decades of the 21st. But in this moment, with the constellation of cruelty and conflict, inequality and violence that, test, that casts its shadow on our times, maybe human rights lessons have something to tell all of us. I've worried most in recent years about two aspects of global human rights practice. The first is the way that human rights practitioners have piled their expectations onto the movement for international criminal justice for individual perpetrators of atrocity, putting their faith in an enormous amount of limited resources in the deterrent effect of a small number of retrospective prosecutions. The second aspect is the understandable focus of critics of human rights on the failure of legal instruments, formal institutions and processes of human rights, and non-governmental organizations of the global north to increase the security and well-being of vulnerable people and groups. We can see it, too, in the over-legalization of the human rights profession and its persistent fascination with litigation, including under theories of universal jurisdiction, in a way that sometimes seems like it's become an end in itself. What is left out of these critiques and priorities? The heart of international human rights law has never been in the international, regional, and national institutions and processes devoted to human rights. Its main value has been as a language for people, communities, and social and political movements to use to demand respect for their rights and accountability for those who abuse them, a tool for those who resist and protest to make their claims against power in language that has acquired the validity of law. The formal means of enforcement are weak. 
but for people demonstrating in the streets of Haiti, Myanmar, Russia, and Hong Kong, Rohingya refugees speaking out in camps in Bangladesh, black people demanding police accountability and reparations in the United States, human rights are not a fancy, elite, abstract language of the status quo, but a powerful language for making demands for justice and respect. So what does this human rights stuff have to do with the moment in which you all begin your careers in law? A moment in which powerful states wreak death and destruction, flouting the international legal order in which the world has invested for the entire 75 years of my lifetime. A moment in which the Supreme Court, on which we have relied to advance the rights of racial minorities, women, LGBTQ people, is at best turning its back on those rights. Law school understandably emphasizes courts and cases, and especially at graduation, we tend to celebrate the power of the law, and in turn, our power to foster change, to achieve justice. It's here that I see the real significance of humility and solidarity. Resort to the courts is seductive in judicially good times, but as we are seeing clearly, painfully clearly now, courts are fickle and unreliable. As lawyers in domestic practice, just as in international human rights practice, achieving justice requires us to be creative, not stuck on courts, and especially to subordinate our elite efforts to movements for justice and equality, to listen to those resisting unjust power, and yes, to help them wield the language of rights and the language of law to make their demands. The Israeli human rights scholar, Ron Dudai, has called for connecting human rights with social movements' struggles on the ground, particularly by working in solidarity with groups that have more radical aims of reorganizing political and social arrangements to diminish concentrations of wealth and power. Again, it is appropriate that we celebrate the more heroic stories of lawyers' victories over injustice, including victories of the law school's clinics. But I'd like to celebrate a different kind of victory, one that models the humility and solidarity and creativity that genuine repair of this broken world requires. For more than a decade, my colleague Hope Metcalf and teams of committed student, students in the Lowenstein Human Rights Clinic have been working first and successfully to close Connecticut's Supermax Prison, Northern Correctional Institution, a place designed in its very architecture to dehumanize and break its residents. And then second, to end Connecticut's use of solitary confinement. When it promised to be useful, the team used the language of human rights, and they dug creatively into the diverse toolbox of advocacy, negotiating with the Department of Correction, suing the Department of Correction, helping to draft and then pushing legislation, making use of the media, organizing carpools to get people to rallies, but most important, they listened to those who suffered solitary confinement, got to know them, earned their trust in representing, in the broadest sense, their interests. The team took its lead from effective families and from the local group, Stop Solitary Connecticut, and from its smart, passionate community members organizing to overcome the power aligned against them. As many of you know, in recent weeks, the governor signed the PROTECT Act, which places legal limits on the use of solitary and creates an advisory commission for correctional oversight that includes mental health experts, formerly incarcerated people, and other community members. Hope and her students were in the background, crediting Stop Solitary and its activists. As our friend Bob Bernstein used to remind us every year at our Bernstein Human Rights Symposium, there's no limit to what you can achieve if you don't care about taking the credit. The heart of this success shone through in the conversation Hope had a week ago with one of the men who has spent many years in solitary and who over the years of the clinic's work has sometimes been angry and frustrated at the inability of the team to help him individually. 
He told Hope that he had been moved watching news of a rally at the state capitol for the PROTECT Act by seeing so many people out in the rain demonstrating for him and for others like him. Hope said that what moved her so deeply was that he was realizing his own power, not only feeling seen and heard for the first time, but knowing that his own efforts to stand up for his rights were part of something bigger, that they could help create something larger than himself, that the efforts of many people had empowered him. You have learned the you have learned these lessons of creative, client-centered lawyering, always questioning assumptions in your clinical courses. And your academic studies have nurtured a critical approach to law that I hope you never lose. One of our human rights clinic students wrote in her written reflection for our concluding discussion this semester, as aspiring advocates, I hope that we will always strive to foreground the humanity and autonomy of the people on whose behalf we speak, hear and validate the lived experiences of our clients, and not, out of a failure to listen, inadvertently perpetuate further harm and suffering. Another of you wrote, most of us not only want to use our power for communities who lack it, but to pursue strategies that shift and deconstruct power. But how to accept the responsibilities and risks associated with grasping that power? My first wish for all of you is that you remember those lessons and the imperatives of humility and solidarity that underlie them. What are my other wishes for all of you today? Be kind. I think Kurt Vonnegut got it exactly right, particularly for a class of law school graduates, when he wrote uh, in a talk welcoming new babies to the earth, there's only one rule that I know of, babies. God damn it, you've got to be kind. Part of the story of this law school has long been that it was the kind law school. Hold us to this promise of kindness. I was proud to go to a law school where my dean, now Judge Calabresi, talked about love more than he talked about law. We haven't always lived up to that promise, insist that we do. Have the courage to stand up for what is right and just, even when your friends and colleagues, even when the law itself seem not to. Finally, work to sustain hope. I want to read a very short poem, Oppression, by Langston Hughes. Now, dreams are not available to the dreamers, nor songs to the singers. In some lands, dark night and cold steel prevail. But the dream will come back, and the song break its jail. So here's what I'd like to leave you with. Even for the safe and free, our duty is hope. Hope is the hardest work. Again, congratulations to all of you in the class of 2022 and your families and friends. Cherish the joy of this day, the potential it celebrates. And I wish you all good work. Work at sustaining hope. Work at the increments of justice you will achieve. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jim. That was beautiful. I have to say, I, I am honored. Um, I shouldn't really think honored is the right word. That's the word in my speech at this moment. But I just want to say that in all of my life, I never thought I would be able to introduce someone uh, like I am about to do. So maybe I should just say, I am gobsmacked <laughs> to introduce this year's guest speaker, Chimamande Adichie. She is dazzling, plain and simple. 
a remarkable writer with a sharp eye and an even sharper pen, she refuses, and I quote, to be deterred or detained by the categories of others, in the words of one observer. Dichie has been called a feminist icon, and she is unquestionably one of the most vital intelligence and originalist novelists of this generation. I could spend a long time uh, going on with all the things that she's been called. So for one, she's been called a genius. She won the MacArthur Genius Grant in 2008 after publishing her second novel, Half of a Yellow Sun, which also received the Orange Prize for fiction and became an international bestseller. She won the Commonwealth Writers' Prize for her first novel, Purple Hibiscus. And with her third novel, Americana, she won the National Book Critics Circle Award and became a New York Times bestseller. In 2015, Time Magazine called her one of the world's 100 most influential people. In 2017, Fortune Magazine listed her among the world's greatest leaders. She's also a teacher. For over a decade, she has led an annual writer's workshop in Lagos to support the next generation of African writers. And I haven't even mentioned her two incredibly famous TED Talks, The Dangers of a Single Story, which is apparently one of the most viewed TED Talks ever, and We Should All Be Feminists, which was then adapted into a book. Even given all of her honorifics and accolades, I think that the title that I appreciate most for her is one that she has called herself, and that is simply Truth Teller. Much of her work is inspired by her experiences or those of her family. She was born in Nigeria and grew up on a university campus where her father was a professor and her mother was the first woman registrar. She moved to the United States for college, graduating from Eastern Connecticut State University and then obtaining a master's degree in creative writing from Johns Hopkins. She's also no stranger to Yale. In 2008, she graduated from here with a degree in African studies and was later awarded an honorary degree at a commencement ceremony like the one you just attended. She's referred to the United States as her second home. And so perhaps it seems apt that her work explores the experience of immigrants, of black people in America, and of women. But her work demonstrates that the exploration of different identities strikes at the heart of questions around who we are. And that regardless of what perspective a text is written from, identity is always at the center. The work of understanding different identities and cultures is not the work of making everyone the same, but of appreciating the differences and the diverse truths that constitute each and every one of us. Dichie once said that stories acknowledge nuance and complexity. And stories show that despite nuance and complexity, the underlying truth remains. The underlying need for justice remains. And what more could we ask for a graduating class of lawyers than to remember that regardless of the case you're working on or the side that you argue, that the underlying truths will always remain. That as much as you will be a zealous advocate for your client, you might also serve something greater. And you must always tell your client's story with integrity. So I'm incredibly proud and honored today to invite you to listen to one of the greatest storytellers of our time, whose truths show us who we really are. Welcome. To all the families and friends here, congratulations. It's so lovely to have the good fortune of witnessing your loved one graduate from the best law school in the country. And to you, Yale Law Class of 2022, congratulations. I know it's been a bit of a difficult time for you, COVID and all, so congratulations. And thank you so much for having me as your speaker. I was happy to know that the extraordinary Dwayne Betts was speaker for last year's class, and I'm grateful to be in such good company. It's also an honor to follow Jim Silk, who is such a wonderful, example of how brilliance and humanity can seamlessly coexist. So I was going to start by telling you not to make any of your life's choices based on what is prestigious, 
but rather based on infinitely more noble reasons. And then I asked myself why I had said yes to giving this commencement speech. <laughs> if not that being asked to speak at Yale Law School is prestigious. So please, do consider prestige <laughs> when making your life choices, but it helps if there are other reasons. In addition to feeling deeply honored and flattered to be asked, I said yes for another reason, which is that I'm a fiction writer, always hungry for material, always alert and watching, hawk-like, for what I can use in my stories. As a child, I sharpened very early on the skill of eavesdropping, a pastime at which I'm still quite adept. So watch out for my next novel and for a character who maybe graduates from Yale Law School or teaches at Yale Law School. And yes, it would be based on you. But there was yet another reason for saying yes and it is because I learned that Heather Gerken is the first woman to be dean, in addition to being um, the first tall dean in some years. <laughs> and, and, and I wanted to come and sprinkle gold dust on her path to signify my delight and my disappointed surprise because I just assumed that Yale Law School should have had a woman dean earlier than now. But, 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 then, but then I remembered that Yale College only started admitting women in 1969. 1969. I have a dress my mother owned in 1969. It's in perfect shape and it doesn't even have that musty smell of thrift shop finds. 1969 is not that long ago, which I suppose says something about Yale, but please don't ask me what it says. <laughs> I'm always happy to be back at Yale, happier than I ever was when I was an actual graduate student here. <laughs> but it really wasn't Yale's fault, even though the first winter I experienced my eyelashes freeze was here in New Haven. It was rather that I longed to write historical fiction, to bring alive the facts of the past, and I felt constrained by the demands of academic writing. And so it wasn't a good fit. I hope your experience has been different, has felt like a good fit. But even if it didn't, you have a degree from the best law school in the bloody country, and I think that is a reason for gratitude. One of the consequences of a fancy education in this country is the embrace of a certain kind of irony, which can sometimes feel like a hollow shield behind which we hide the vulnerable truths of who we are. And so I will briefly put down my shield, because I'm guilty of it as well, to say with an unapologetic earnestness that I know many of you came here with idealistic dreams and I hope you still hold those dreams close and I hope you know that idealism versus realism is a false choice and I hope you continue to refuse to accept that unacceptable things must remain as they are. I, I am both idealistic and practical, and I believe we must dream. We visualize the world we want, and then, small brick by small brick, we try to build it. You can wrest justice from an American criminal justice system that is often unjust. You can give back dignity to those dispossessed. You can undo in no matter how small a way, a legal system that continues to accord value on the basis of how much money you have, the color of your skin, who you love, where you pray. 
you can have that beautiful but unfulfilled ideal of equal justice under law as the propelling force of your life's work. But what we need in addition to law is love. And I say this too with an irony-free earnestness. In one of the most beautiful languages in the world, Igbo, the word for love is ifunanya, and the literal translation is to see someone. We have to see one another better. We must think more in collective terms because this savage individualism will not serve us. I, I, I was recently telling a friend that I, would, that I would be speaking here to brilliant people who have been taught by the best legal scholars and that I wasn't sure I had anything useful to say. And my friend replied, just don't be political. <laughs> Maybe my friend meant, don't do your usual tired rant about how American politics has become so simplistic in its division, so elementary in its tribalism, that it flies in the face of what we know to be true. That one tribe cannot always be right, and the other tribe always wrong. Or maybe my friend meant, don't ask the students what it feels like to be graduating from the same law school that gave us that recently leaked draft opinion, which argues, astonishingly, that my female body is not really mine. My friend meant well, but I could not help but bristle at that advice, don't be political. Because sometimes what we call politics are actually the things we deeply value, the things that give meaning to our lives. And maybe being honest about our politics can present the opportunity for healthy debate. And by healthy debate, of course, I mean the opportunity to convince the other side that you are right and that they are evil. <laughs> that was a joke. It says something about the state of our discourse today that I feel the need to clarify that. And so, as you go forth, whether you sail away to a Supreme Court clerkship, so apparently this is a pipeline to that, or, or to a law firm, or to community work, or to academia, or politics, I want to gently recommend this to you. Please do not be nice. Be kind, because kindness is a measure of our humanity. But do not be nice. Nice means wanting always to be liked. And this is a particular affliction of female socialization. Nice means silencing inconvenient truths. Nice means choosing always to be comfortable. Nice means letting go of courage. Nice means talking about peace but not about justice. Nice will not remake the world, and there is so much about our world that needs remaking. And having this degree means you can remake the world if you choose to, because laws do not fall from the sky. Laws are made and interpreted by people, people like you. And while you bravely remake the world, please be skeptical of perfection. Because perfection is, among other things, utterly boring. I am convinced of this because I have learned from literature that there is no such thing as a perfect human being. The longing for perfection will hold you back. It doesn't help any cause to start with perfection as yardstick. We do not need to be perfect before we are able to do what is right. I think of literature as my religion, and by far the greatest lesson I have learned is how we are more alike than not. I would read a novel, and in a few lines, or in a character description, I would feel a sudden internal shiver, that beautiful shock of mutuality, a sense of wonder 
that a writer born a hundred years ago, or born in a white body, or born in a male body, or born into a culture so removed from mine, had so perfectly articulated exactly what I felt and made me feel less alone in a vast world. I say this not merely to plug novels, because I cannot help myself, but also because, as the wonderful Alice McDermott put it, we read novels to be able to live multiple lives. And it seems to me that lawyers probably need that more than most. I mean the multiple lives bit. But really, it matters that we remember, actively remember, that we are universally human. That we may show love differently, but we all love. That what matters to us may differ, but we all want to matter. That we should extend grace as much as we expect grace. That dignity is always as important as bread. Finally, I hope you enjoy today. I wonder how you're feeling, each one of you. How are you? So maybe you feel happiness, or something like happiness. Maybe your happiness was fleeting. Maybe a darkness descended like a shroud on your mood this morning. Maybe you're already questioning your law school decision. <laughs> Seems to have struck a chord. <laughs> Maybe you worry that you're not feeling what you're supposed to feel. Because the truth is that during life's major transitions, our feelings are often shaded, often nuanced, often complicated. Which makes me think of what seems to be an enduring peril of our times, this epidemic of unfulfillment, this feeling that something is missing. And so it leads us to think, just one more thing, and then I'll be happy. But the happiness is now, or at least the happiness potential is now. The world is a multifaceted place, imperfect but beautiful, full of friendships waiting to be formed, ideas waiting to be explored, experiences waiting to be had, good deeds waiting to be done. It helps to make peace with uncertainty, to learn to live with uncertainty. It helps, too, to know that nobody is ever as together as they seem. I know all of you are type A, perfectly clever, perfectly brilliant people who have your SHIT together. <laughs> but you also all have issues, because we all have issues. And maybe it's time to reframe that incredibly American idea of the pursuit of happiness so that perhaps we might seek in life not so much happiness as meaning. Because then meaning will, should, bring happiness. So I wish you a future filled with meaning. I wish you everything you wish for yourself that causes no harm to others. Congratulations. students walk across the stage, uh, our degree recipients sort of uh, today. Um, as you all know, your degrees have not yet been conferred by the university, but soon, soon, assuming you resolve your paper debt sooner rather than later. <laughs> but I just want to say a few words um, to talk about the day. Uh, I know you've gone through a lot these last three years, and it feels so good to be able to give you an in-person ceremony where you are all together with your family and friends. And in that sense, I want to take a moment to pause and think about those who could not be with us. So my heart in particular is heavy with the absence of our own Chris Lim, who we lost far too soon. 
I think of Chris every time I walk by that beautiful piano in the dining hall that bears his name, and today I know all of our hearts go out to his friends and family. I also can't help but reflect on what a unique experience you all had here in New Haven, navigating the law school in the midst of a once-in-a-century pandemic. Law school is hard even in a typical time. Most YLS students spend their time worrying about paper debt and clerkships and what comes next. All of that seems so small by comparison to what you all have faced. Your class left for spring break on March 6, 2020 and did not return until the fall at the earliest. As far as I'm aware, that was unprecedented in the history of this law school. Now, I'd love to tell you that the faculty knew exactly what we were doing as we were trying to get ready for this, but I'll just be clear with you. We were struggling to figure out how to make this place Yale Law School for all of you, how to teach in a way that is entertaining all of this on Zoom. We were so desperate that we constantly had teaching sessions, one of which where Amy Kapczynski taught us all how to turn ourselves into a banana on screen <laughs> so that we could keep you entertained. A few weeks later, some of you may remember the meme where a lawyer accidentally turned himself into a cat, and I realized that Amy Kapczynski really should have taught us how to turn off the banana. <laughs> but what leaves me in awe of this class is that you did everything that most YLS students do. You did extraordinary academic work. You did wonderful lawyering during a period when it would have been remarkable just to get through. What touched me even more is that you didn't stop there. You helped one another get through. There was nothing good about going to law school during COVID, nothing. But as we all look back on the last three years, it's clear that you acquired strengths and skills that go well beyond lawyering, well beyond the intellectual or professional, strengths and skills that I hope will sustain you as you go forward. So for one thing, you learn one crucial lesson much sooner than most graduates do, that your journey will never unfold in the way that you think it will. Anyone a decade out from law school could tell you this, but you all live this lesson in ways that no previous law school class ever has. Uncertainty is hard for people who come to this place with checklists and plans and absolute confidence that they can control their own destiny. It's humbling. It reminds you that for most of your life, you've been blessed with certainty. It reminds you how essential it is to recognize that uncertainty is part of most people's daily life and that you are lucky, graced even, to have as much steadiness and stability as you do. You've also learned something that is a lesson often learned too late, which is how much we need one another. I'm always surprised to discover law students who think they got here entirely on their own steam. But if anything will shatter that illusion, it's COVID. None of us, not a single one of us, made it here alone. I know that when you're on your fifth Zoom meeting and wondering whether you had been turned into an avatar in the eyes of your classmates, when you heard tough news about a loved one or the state of the world, it was not your position on a journal, the state of your CV or your transcript that sustained you. It was love, the community you found for yourself here. It was the family and friends who brought you through trials and tribula tribulations before law school, before you even set foot here and helped you with your journey along the way. You also learned that as a community and individuals, we can rebuild. The thing that I've just adored about this class is actually watching you over the last semester. You are the only students here who saw the law school before the onset of the pandemic. Unique among law school classes, at least in recent memory, you were the ones that were stewards of this institution and what has made it so special for generations. You told the one else what the table was. You gathered people for sunlit celebrations and ridiculous traditions. You mentored the two classes who followed you. You even brought back what I, as dean, officially declared to be the cornerstone of our community, the Law Review. And unlike any classes in recent memory, you have served as the link between past generations of graduates to those who have yet to arrive between the glorious place this was pre-pandemic 
and the glorious place that we are rebuilding it into. And so today, when you walk across the stage and graduate from Yale Law School, know that your place in our community doesn't end when you exit these doors. You will always be part of our family. You will always be in our heart. We will always glory in your successes. So before we have all of you walk, I want to say two sets of thank yous. So the first is to the faculty and the staff. So I know that as you were all going through what you went through the last few years, it may have sometimes have been invisible to you that the staff and the faculty were going through many of the same things and even some different things. I have never been so moved uh, to watch what happened during those periods, just thinking about what the staff members did, the, all the IT folks who came in that first week when the dangers were unknown, but they were determined to make school possible for you. And as to the faculty, I'll just say that the story that really lingers in my memory was that first summer, where you may remember that the president at the time decided to pass a rule that said for international students that if they weren't attending classes in person that they could, they had to deport themselves. And that was fine for us because we were going to have in-person classes. But if you read further down the rule, what you discovered was that should we have to suspend in-person classes, which would only happen if the pandemic became even worse than it was, should we have to do so, we were supposed to send our international students home. It was in the middle of the summer, Ian, Ayers, and I called every single member of the faculty over a 48-hour period. And we asked each of them a simple question, which was this. If that should happen, would you be able to tutor one international student with a class so that we could keep them here? And one faculty after another said yes. Every single one of them, Guido, I'm gonna do my Guido imitation, Guido said, I will just open the door to my farmhouse and we will have a conversation. And I still remember one faculty member who is actually sitting in this uh, room with us today said, you tell them I'll teach in the snow if I have to. So I ask you to thank the faculty and staff for all they've done for the last two years. Now we also have one more thank you, um, precisely because we all know that you didn't get here on your own steam. So I just want to look to all of the folks here in the audience to express our collective gratitude to each and every one of you, because you are the ones who made today possible. In the best of years, we owe you a debt, but now in particular, we owe thanks to siblings and friends and spouses who stood by our students' side. We owe thanks to family members who year after year ran the modern gauntlet of schools and homework, illnesses, practices, lessons, applications, and breakups while doing what they could to keep our students safe and secure. We owe thanks to every relative who set out for an unknown country or state or city in search of a better life for their families. And we owe thanks to everyone in this audience for putting up with some of the most argumentative and annoying people on the planet. Thank you for that. So once again, I just want to give all of you a chance to stand and turn and thank your friends and families for being here with us today. And with that, I will turn it over to Dean Silverstein for the reading of the degrees. Dean Gerken, members of the faculty, distinguished guests, friends, and family, it's my high privilege and distinct honor to present to you candidates for and recipients of advanced degrees in law. Please note that due to COVID-related public health concerns, the degree candidates have been asked to refrain from the traditional handshake and to keep masks on at all times indoors. Allow me now to present to you candidates for the degree of Doctor of the Science of Law, Fernando Baracchini and his son, Filippa. <laughs> 
Sebastian Guidi. Anat Lior with her children, Ellie and Alex. Gregor Novak. For the degree of Master of Laws, Akshat Argawal. Akriti Gaur. Yusuf Al Tamimai. Safwan Amin. Esuvio Rodrigo Adiala Mire. Korosh Bellis. Yonat Ben Ozer. Thais Penteado. Liat Dasht. Antoine de Spigler. Doruk Erhan. Nicolas Elguera Miranda. <laughs> Zhao Lufan. <laughs> Santiago Garcia Aramillo. <laughs> Leticia Gianni. Rea Tasmin Sara Gomez. Alejandro Samuel Gonzalez Cataneo. Allah Haj Yashia. Joachim Nicola Herrera. Eva Marguerite Herzog. <laughs> Julian Hintz. <laughs> Kang Min Ju. <laughs> Joseph Buchanan Landman. Jean Baptiste Lemaire, <laughs> Yu Ping Lin, <laughs> Mili Mutios Ramsey, <laughs> Maria Garcia Narano. Oz Pinkos. Bruno Polino Renzetti. Danielle Quintanilla. Lina Rimar. Lucia Rodrigo.
Pamela Rock. Oscar Nevin Sherry. Paolo Tamashe. Kami Van Petechem. Chantelle Vivian Van Wiltenberg. And for the degree of Master of Studies in Law, Benedict Patrick Coleridge. Catherine Julia Harlow. Robert C. Scher. Congratulations. Gherkin, members of the faculty, distinguished guests, friends, and family. It is my distinct privilege and high honor to present to you the candidates for the Juris Doctor Degree in Law from the Yale Law School Class of 2022. Samuel Lewis Aber. Anya Cork Allen. <laughs> Nicole Rose Alicock. <laughs> Richard Altieri. <laughs> Joshua Adam Altman. Zachary Aaron Austin. Michael Sheffer Aviona. Samuel Thurman Ayers. And Rebecca Baker. Sarah Ann Baldinger. Henry Atticus Bayaceros. Thonushri Bunso. Hannah Barbosa Sesnick. Nayla Basma. <laughs> David Basali. <laughs> Henry Robert Bauer. <laughs> Leonik Begyan. Samantha Claire Bensinger. Brendan Berniker. Daniel Ricardo Betancourt. Helia Bedad. Kyle Bigley. Woo! 
Charlotte Foster Black. Joshua Paul Britt. Andrew Blake Broad. Rebecca Claire Brooks. Natasha Haiti Brunstein. Jackson Thomas Bush. Yolanda Bustillo. Nicole Cabanez. Catherine Barley Camp. Emily Jocelyn Caputo. Evelyn Caro Gutierrez. <laughs> Hannah Kathleen Curis. <laughs> Raleigh Carolyn Cavero. <laughs> Letitia Chai. Angela Chan. Ifeanwa Karen Chikese. Simon Chin. Benjamin Kyu Hyung Choi. Grace Unhe Choi. <laughs> Emily Jo Cody. <laughs> Luke White Connell. <laughs> Charles Kent Crosby. Kayla Marie Crow. <laughs> Tyler Huang Viet Dang. <laughs> Gabriel Delaney. <laughs> Benjamin Hayes De La Roca. Sabrine Jamil. Quint Clark Doan. Elsa Perry Dots. Nathaniel Wall Donahue. Elena Egas. Ariadne Mota Ellsworth. Elaine Janice Emmerich. May Espinosa. Christopher Martin Ewell. Bardia Vesegi. Catherine Fang. Alexandra 
Sarah Fay. Catherine Marie Foy. Alexander Michael Fisher. Justice Isabel Forty. Eric Q. Fredrickson. David Bradley Frumkin. Deepankar Gagnesia. Ali Marot Gali. Paula Andrea Garcia Salazar. Jason Paul Gardner. Liam Janeri. Natalie Elizabeth Giotta. Max Jesse Goldberg. Alexandra Gonzalez. Wynn Muscatine Graham. Caroline Rebecca Gruskin. Daisy Ann Gilliard. Catherine Ramsey Hamilton. Samuel Haynes Heavenrich. Frank Ethan Hedgepeth. Timothy Nicholas Herschel Burns. Colby Marie Holderness. Patrick Offit Holland. Elaine Homeland. Margaret Stoddard House. Samuel Eric DeFritas Hull. Ryden Charlotte Ishida. Gavin Wayne Jackson. Lias Mauni Jalali Yazdi. Shea Steinberger Jindrusana. Sperthy Jonalagada. Grace Judge. Ezra Kagan. Aniket Kasari. Fiza Zarka Khan. Sheriful Islam Khan.
Clarissa Glenn Kimmy. <laughs> Selena Nicole Kitchens. Cleo Sophia Kohler. Elise Costell. Bapu Kotapati. Elizabeth Catherine Kriska. Perry Joseph Kumagai. Irene Kwan. Robert James LaRose. Maxim Labunski. Zane Lakani. Desiree Nicole Lane. Loran Cyrus Laskai. Emily Weyan Lau. Jared Joseph Lebrun. Victor Roman Liao. Danny Lee. Angie Liao. Adela Lilolari. Yashang Lin. Joseph Brian Linfield. Lawrence Joan Fan Liu. Patrick Austin Liu. Ryan Liu. Marnie Lowe. Estrella Maria Lucero. Wellington Mackey with Wellington the Third. Jacob Michael Madden. <laughs> Catherine Ann Porky Mahoney. <laughs> Logan John Malik. Laura Geraldine Markey. <laughs> Zoe Lindyway Lewis Masters. <laughs> Miguel Maurizio. <laughs> Ro
Robert Reed McInvale III. Grace Camilla York Marmel. Jeffrey Robert Metzger. Kara Ross Meyer. Randy Beth Michelle. Andrea Mishko, Patrick Carter Monahan, Emma Rebecca Montoya, Destiny Rose Murphy. Nicole Yun Lin Ng. <laughs> Kyun Ning. <laughs> Zaria Antoinette Noble. <laughs> Alexander Knox. Andrew Intim. <laughs> Daniel Eduardo Ocampo. <laughs> Jacqueline Nicole Osterblad. <laughs> Nina Leah Michiko Iishi. Kathleen Elise Olds. <laughs> Summer Omar. <laughs> Uzomo Kenneth Orchingwa. <laughs> Ayub Oderni. Andrew Paulus. Walter Yekarach Paul. Rachel Corinne Perler. Alistair Nathaniel Phillips Robbins. William Frederick Poff Webster. <laughs> Sarah Pertle. <laughs> Siwan Sonia Chin. <laughs> Fernando Quiroz. Austin Patrick Regan. Angela Rose Remus. Phoenix Michaela Rice Johnson. Alexandra Nicole Rex. Simone Rivera. <laughs> Eleanor Roberts. <laughs> D 
Daria Rose. Ezra Ruiz. Manny Rutnell. Kenny Ray Sabbath. Isser Said. Emily Maria Sarton. Joe Colin Sati. Morgan Ellen Savage. Joshua Michael Shank. Daniel Thomas Shackleford. Akanksha Shah. Kaveri Sharma. Kristen Anjali Sharman. Emil Ramez Shehada. Yitsong Shen. Cameron Blake Silverglade with Lily. Joseph Edward Simmons with Sybil. Jackson Bruce Skeen. Alexandra Michelle Smith. Casey Catherine Smith. <laughs> Rachel Valentina Summers. <laughs> Rachel Alana Stryer. <laughs> Mayda Swami Mathan. Delaram Takiyar. Thaddeus Anthony Talbot. Chelsea Larray San Clemente Thompson. Anthony Mark Tomei. Sarah Mackenzie Walker. Evan Benjamin Walker Wells. Emily Lou Wang. Nathaniel Gustav Warner. Xaviera Webb. Alexander Matthew Weiss. Derek 
Weiss with Wendy and Benjamin. Taylor Withrow. Emmett Witkowski Eldred. Kaloa Haafuluhau Wolfram. Noelle Nelson Wyman. <laughs> Wen Yi Shu. <laughs> Sean Ling Shu with Pi. Michael Zeb the third. <laughs> Leah Zuckerman. <laughs> and finally, joining us from the Yale School of Medicine's graduation, from which she just received her Doctor of Medicine degree, the final Juris Doctor candidate is Carolyn Shingwen Lai. And now I'd like to welcome the president of the Yale Law School Executive Committee, Craig Broad, a member of the Yale Law School class of 1980. Thank you very much, Dean Cosgrove, to our extraordinary graduates. On behalf of your alumni body, the Yale Law School Association, known as the YLSA, and the Yale Law School Fund Board, congratulations to the great class of 2022 on your YLS graduation, and you are now all members for life in the YLSA. Forty-two years ago, almost to the day, as a member of the Yale Law School class of 1980, I remember sitting where you are. Actually, we were in the courtyard that day. Filled with pride and a great feeling of accomplishment, but also a profound sense of gratitude to the family members, friends, teachers, and other mentors who helped to guide me that day. And it is so wonderful that so many of you could be joined today in person by those close to you. And I echo Dean Gherkin in recognizing you all. During your time at Yale Law School, you strengthened this community with your passionate pursuit and commitment to excellence your service, and your transformative actions. And you did that all in the face of a pandemic, and you were not deterred. 
And on this journey, as did I so many years ago, you gained a global circle of friends made up of Yale Law School's faculty, administrators, staff, your fellow students, and graduates. Today is the day that the Yale Law School community comes together to celebrate your great educational and academic accomplishments. We also look forward to witnessing the many ways in which you will each enrich our YLS community and the YLSA and make the world around us a better place in the years to come. We could not be more proud to welcome you into our YLS alumni family. On a very personal level, I join you in the emotions of this day, and I'm truly honored to share this moment with you. On behalf of Yale Law School graduates around the globe, I offer you our heartfelt congratulations and invite you to enjoy the gift from us to you that is located beneath your seats. Again, congratulations to the great class of 2022. All the best and thank you. So we have not one uh, surprise to end our commencement ceremony, but actually two. So in addition to a little bit of swag, because it wouldn't be Yale Law School without leaving with some swag, we have a very special guest who just appeared, uh, who you've seen already once today. It is my incredible honor to, to have Judge Myron Thompson here with us today. So Judge Thompson received the highest award that Yale University accords. He received the same highest award that we accord as a law school a few years back. And I just want to say a few words and let him bid you all goodbye. So let me just say a brief description of what Judge Thompson has done with his life and career. He was born in Tuskegee, Alabama in 1947, during a time when black men were still lynched for failing to address white men as sir. He was raised in the shadow of the Civil Rights Movement and grew up in a household where names like Judge Mar Martin Luther King and Judge Frank Johnson were household names. Judge Thompson learned from his own struggles and the challenge he faces, faces by those that he admired that in his word, a life without adversity is a life without success. After graduating from this law school, Judge Count Thompson became the first African American Assistant Attorney General for the state of Alabama. And with that appointment, he became the first black employee of the state who was neither a janitor nor a teacher. Judge Thompson would go on to be nominated to the federal bench by President Jimmy Carter at the ripe old age of 33, which is a moment when many of us are just starting to figure out what we want to do with our lives. He became the youngest member of the federal judiciary and from that bench became a champion of civil rights. I have lost track of how many extraordinary decisions Judge Thompson has rendered for those who most need protection. He has been nothing short of heroic in all that he does. It is an extraordinary honor to have him with us here today, and I just want to invite Judge Thompson to give you one final goodbye before we end. Judge Myron Thompson. Thank you very much. You know, the only thing is that you're supposed to get a standing ovation after your remarks, so I think I should go sit down. <laughs> now, it, it is a real pleasure to be here today. It was exactly 50 years ago that I walked across, not this stage, but finished the law school. I'm not going to share with you uh, the, the words, some words of inspiration, because those have already been shared with you by people who are a lot better at that than I am. And I didn't hear the remarks earlier today, but I'm sure that they have left you uh, fully ready to take on the world. I also won't leave you with any sort of legal uh, or words, uh, nuggets, because I'm sure you've gotten enough of those during your four years here at Yale. 
But uh, I thought I, I would just share with you very quickly and briefly, because I know you've been sitting here quite a while, a story. And uh, this story, which is true, takes place in Yale Law School. Uh, I know many of you know the hallway that goes down the middle of the law school, and I believe it's off to the right. There's still a student area. Well, 50 years ago, I was sitting in that student area, and I don't know whether I was waiting for someone, a friend, or studying, or whatever, but, you know, I was passing the time there, and a fellow student walks up to me, and she says, Myron, what are you going to do after you leave law school? And I said, well, you know, I've been thinking about this pretty carefully, and I've decided to go back to Alabama, which is where I grew up. And she said, you're going back to Alabama? I said, yes. She said, you know, I don't know about that. You know, uh, people down there, you know, you may be somewhat intellectually unchallenged. And I said, what? I said, that's a true insult. I said, what I'd like to do is I want to do justice. I want to right wrongs. I want to do things that will advance the cause of, 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 of people who've been forgotten. And she listened to that a little bit longer, and she said, you went back to Alabama? I said, yeah. She says, I know what you're really up to. You want to be a big fish in a small pond. And she walked away. And it's often the case, you know, when you have a strong argument with someone, it's only after they walk away that you seriously consider the argument. And I said, she's right. <laughs> I said, so uh, I'm here to speak to you about small ponds. I know that some of you are going to big ponds, and maybe my remarks won't resonate with you, but you know, you can squirrel them away in the back of your mind one day. But we small ponds, you know, have produced senators and and uh, congressmen and presidents, even people who receive honorary degrees from Yale. So what's the message? You know, think about us down in Alabama and across this country and all the other small ponds that are out there where Yale graduates are, uh, are making a difference. And uh, I am honored to be here today to represent those in small ponds. Congratulations. So a little bit of housekeeping. Uh, first, just to ask all the guests that we have here to wait until the, the faculty and the students process out before leaving. Um, and I should just say that we want to invite you over to the courtyard uh, for um, some food and some drink and a chance to talk to the many faculty members who want to tell you how wonderful your child is. Uh, um, I should just say that in some ways it's, it's really gratifying to be here and there at this moment. When the class of 2020 graduated, you all remember there was nothing that we could do. And there was some thought, should we just, you know, put everything on film? These things can be a little stuffy, even with um, the funny hats and everyone in person. We decided we wouldn't just film a normal ceremony, but we wanted to figure out what was magic. And to our minds, there were two things that are magic about this day. And the first is the memories that you are sharing with each other. And the second is the moment when you walk over there and get a chance to have someone come to you and say what a difference that your child or your partner or your friend made in their lives. And so I just want to invite you to come linger in the sunshine for one last time in the courtyard. We love you very much. Come back soon, and congratulations again to the class of 2022.